Good morning, everybody. We'll get started in a few minutes. If you guys have any questions or anything in the meantime, um, feel free to ask them. I look forward to, to hearing from you. Um, Angie is going to be our guest today. Uh, she is running a few minutes late. She's letting me know. So um, we'll get started on that a little bit later, but we got plenty to talk about before that. If you guys have any questions or anything, otherwise, we'll start talking about the market a little bit before she gets here. So fire away if you guys have something to talk about or any questions. Brian, good morning, it's Malvis. Hi, Malvis. Good morning. Uh, I do have questions in regards of the Florida bar installation addendum. Mm -hmm. um, I do have questions on the page one, I believe. Yeah, page one, where it's asking uh, for sellers to complete that section. Um, on the first paragraph of that page, <clears throat> on that addendum where the buyer usually completes the section normally, the, sell, the buyers would put in the increment amount that they're willing to pay. And then on the second sentence of that paragraph, they put in the amount of the maximum that they're willing to pay. Um, but then right underneath that, where it said seller to complete this section, um, is that if the seller counters back to the buyers uh, for the max amount, or does that paragraph or sentence is to be left in blank? Hold on one second. I want to look at this. I know you sent me something this morning. Yeah. I've got to look at this while I'm... Which document is she talking about? The uh, escalation, are you talking about the escalation addendum, the far bar? Yes. It says escalation addendum to contract. Because I've seen escalations, but I've seen them either written in a additional terms of a contract that the buyer is willing to pay, la, 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 up to blah, blah, blah. And I've seen... Um, also, like a blank addendum um, where the, the buyer's agent put in buyers willing to pay X amount up to the purchase price or not to exceed blah, blah, blah. But I've never seen this one in particular that is already uh, there um, to just, I guess, click on the blanks. Yeah, yeah, Mel, this is what I prefer you guys use. This is, that way you're not writing legal legal agenda like like we what we talked about with the attorney so you have um this is a there's a far bar escalation addendum to contract for those of you who have not seen it and it has just fill in the blanks like contracts do and i'll re refresh you guys we are not attorneys so the florida association of realtors and the florida bar get together and they write these contracts that any dummy can fill in the blanks and that's us as realtors any dummies okay can fill in the blanks and where we're not writing legalese so we're just filling in blanks, completely legal for us to do that because we are lay people, we are not attorneys. So we are professionals in our field, but we are not attorneys writing legal documents. So what they got, what happens is, at any, any, it's funny, any addendum comes from lawsuits, okay, and problems and what lawyers hear about and what the, what, uh, uh, the legal system has to deal with. That's why there's an HOA disclosure. At some point, somebody sold a property in an HOA and they didn't disclose that you have to pay the HOA and you can't have the camper out in front of the house, et cetera, et cetera. So they made an HOA addendum, right? So there's a there's an addendum for all everything that could be a problem that they can keep up with. Um, as you guys know, 10 years ago, there was no escalation addendum because it wasn't necessary. Nobody was doing that. Somebody came up with an idea, started writing it into contracts, and there it is. Um, so that's that's what we're looking at here um now malvis your question buyer to complete this section they filled in how much they want it to go up with their escalation amount and then not to uh go over a maximum purchase price so in this case um they offered 327 and then they offered a thousand dollars up to three thirty three thousand dollar increments up to 337 um so that's then, the so, max amount that they're willing to pay that's correct it. Correct, and this doesn't come into effect at all unless you get a you have another offer over three twenty seven. Okay, um, oh. right. So this doesn't just go up to automatically to three thirty seven. Moms, you have to have an offer for three thirty, and it goes up to three thirty one, 
or an offer for 335, it goes up to 336. So oh, it's only a thousand dollars better than your next offer. And you have to have a, as it says in here, I don't see the wording exactly, a bona fide, unexpired, um, which means not beyond time for acceptance, offer from a competing buyer reviewed by an acceptable to sell, received by an acceptable to seller, quotes the competing offer, the increase shall be calculated as follows. And then it says buyer agrees purchase price shall be increased by $1,000 over the purchase price set forth in competing offer up to $337,000, which is called the maximum purchase price. If the ex ex increased purchase price exceeds the maximum purchase price, the buyer's offer shall be maximum purchase price and escalation amount will be reduced accordingly. So this only comes into effect if you have a competing offer that's a little bit better than these people. Um, now we saw a lot of this at the beginning when the market first started taking off and going crazy. People were doing this and you guys were calling me and saying, uh, I don't know why this isn't working. My, my people are, at the, well, it's only a thousand dollars more than your mm -hmm. other offer. Even if, uh, even when you had like multiple offers and this would only be a thousand dollars more. And these people were saying, well, we, you know, we have a, a sale of our property contingency in there, but we're, but we did an escalation. So we should be the highest offer. Um, and it looks like they picked somebody else's offer. Well, yeah, an extra thousand dollars isn't going to make me want to deal with your contingency, right? That's so. what I was going to ask you because um, just because this escalation clause is being offered for a thousand dollars more, if the seller sees another offer with I don't know better terms or bigger down payment or less inspection period or anything, they don't have to take this because the other terms are better, correct? Just because that is an escalation clause is being sent, it doesn't mean that it has to be accepted or you have to present the other offers? Malvis, what is the most important term on a contract? Uh, the purchase price, I guess. No. And it, is whatever, it is whatever the seller yeah. decides it is. It is there's oh. absolutely a price is just another term on here. It might they might be closing date conscious, just like when you go and buy a car at a car lot, you might be worried about what your trade in is going to get. You might be worried about the interest rate on your financing. You might be worried about uh, the sticker price of the car, You might, whatever it is. There's different hot buttons. That's how they get you, by the way, the different hot buttons that you're going to go in there and say, by golly, I'm going to get ten thousand dollars for my trade. And they'll say, fine, you know, well, they'll say, I got to talk to my manager. I don't know about that. And then they're going to charge you over sticker on the car you're buying, you know, so they're going to get you one way or another, but it's the same for this, whatever their hot button is, whatever's most important to them, offering more money, uh, especially when there's appraisals out there, you know, these, these as is have built in appraisal contingencies, especially when there are appraisals out there. What, if I offered you, if I offered you uh 385 for your house and I'm going to close in three months and, uh, and I want my, my um, financing contingency all the way up to closing, are you going to accept that offer? No, of course, because it's not a, it's, it's no more than what you got here. It's going to be dictated by the appraisal. And now I just tied your property up for three months. You know, it's a bad, it's a terrible offer. So it, that price is not the most. Well, sometimes it can be the most important for a lot of people. It is because they just get narrow minded and that's what they see. And you guys have all dealt with this. Uh, if you've done a lot of listings, you've talked to your sellers and they've said, no, 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 I want the higher price. And you say, but this is not as good. Their financing is not strong. Oh, no, I want the higher price. Right. You guys have all dealt with that before. No, when we talked about selling, we wanted 389 and, you know, this one's 390 and that's the one that we want, regardless of how bad the terms are or how weak their financing is. So, um, okay. you know, is a cash offer for 385 better than a finance offer for 390? That's up to your seller. There's no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's up to your seller. So um, in this case, I know you have an unreasonable seller, um, kind of, you know, stubborn seller. So um, good luck with that. The um, it's Malvis's house, everybody. Yes, <laughs> well, it's, it's a very low offer, Ryan. It's like extremely low. Well, then, um, then, then I, I mean, I don't know what we're talking about. I mean, I was, I was happy for you because uh, last week you're talking about your or a couple weeks ago you're struggling to sell it, and now you've got yes. escalation clauses, right? But the my husband is not pleased with the amount. Um, and then um, my other question in regards of that particular addendum. So the second part of it, where it said seller to complete this section, does the seller has to fill anything else in there? Um, where does it say seller has to complete this section? Uh, seller to complete this section. 
Um, seller agrees to revise. Yeah, you fill this out because yeah, the seller. So in an escalation, the seller has a responsibility. Yes, you have to tell them. They just want you to tell them what their new offer is here. But then you have to provide the backup. You have to, the mm-hmm. the supporting evidence, which is the other offer, and say, look, um, you know, uh, Mike Sperling brought me this offer of three hundred thirty five thousand dollars, and it is a bona fide offer. Um, and these people, just so you guys. Interestingly, they wrote in here in the additional terms, escalation of denim only applies to cash offers or conventional loan offers. So if Mike- That was my next question. Well, that's that was that's, my next question. that's legitimate. They can do that if they want to. They could say cash offers only if they wanted to. They can say whatever. They gave you an addendum and they're saying it only applies to that, which is perfectly fine. Um, they can narrow it down like that. That's perfectly fine. Um, so that means if the sellers get FHAs or VA offers, that are above that offer, this escalation clause does not apply. Correct. But you can counter offer your offer. You don't have to stick with that offer. You can counter them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, of course you can counter offer, but you're not stuck with that at all. Um, All right. Any other questions? By the way, this guy, this agent writes their own their own uh, additional terms. You can see they did not get attorneys because they used irregardless in an additional term. Um, yes. attorney did, an attorney did not write that. Um, so, um, okay. Or, do you have any other questions on that, on that escalation? No. Uh, Malice, no, Malice just... is asking escalation questions when the market's going the other direction. I love it. That's no, great. No, be... <laughs> Because I've never seen this form, Ryan. I've never seen it. And I didn't know if by having that type of form, um, if the sellers are kind of like obligated to present all the offers to that particular one. But they no, don't no, 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 no. You do not have to choose an offer based on price at all. You guys have all done this. You guys have all, trust me, they, they call me when this happens is I offered, you know, uh, Malvis accepted an offer from somebody else and I offered more. My I had to be the highest offer. And you guys have called me, you guys have called me too and said I offered forty thousand over appraisal and I didn't get the I didn't get the property. It, price is not what determines everything, guys. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's lots of reasons to choose other offers. You guys have those of you who have uh, any significant amount of experience have told sellers please don't pay attention to just the price, right? Because this offer is bad because of this. I don't think this is going to close. I don't, I got a bad feeling for these people. This isn't going to close. These people haven't looked at the house yet and they're offering. And, and this one is the same offer, maybe a few dollars less, but I feel better because these people have already seen the house, right? Mm-hmm. So you guys have all had some reason that you've told a seller to take an offer that wasn't quite as much as something else because you felt better about it. Um, and of course, sometimes they've listened and sometimes they haven't, right? So um, that's that. Uh, Angie, I see that you're on here. Um, you're going to need, obviously, a few minutes. You're not doing this from your car. So I, I assume. Okay, you need a few minutes? Oh, you're, no, you're, I'm going to have to do it from my car. or else Oh, you are. Safe. But I can make it work. I have my notes with me. Luckily, I keep everything in Google Drive, so I always have it. Awesome. And you're gonna, are you going to need the screen as well? No, that's okay. I, I looked through my notes. I don't have anything that I can... Um, screen share other than just like kind of MLS searches for things, but um, we can kind of just go over that. I think I think we're good. Okay. Well, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready when you are. Awesome. Everybody's got, everybody's got all their ch- chit chat out. Well, no, we need to chit chat a little bit more because I want to talk, kind of bring this into um, why this is important. And guys, I don't know if you got your little Florida realtor email today um, and I got mine and put it in the red somewhere. Um, but uh, consumers, 17% of people now think it is a good time to buy. That is down from whatever normal is. Um, they did not clarify that, but only 17% of consumers feel like it's a good time to buy. Um, people who feel like it's a good time to sell always it's also down. I told you guys that uh, when it's a good time to buy, it's a good time to sell, right? I've always uh, told you guys that, and, and people seem to that figured that out that when it's a bad time to buy, it's probably a bad time to sell, you know, interest rates are high and blah, blah, blah. But all of that also that consumer confidence in buying part of that is our responsibility on an unrelated note to what we're doing today. Um, 
with your social media and your and your uh, talking to people, get the word out about why now it is a good time to buy. And if you don't know, go back over the last couple of weeks when we've been talking about it with lenders, et cetera, about why it is a good time to buy. Um, but we need to get that message out as a as an industry um, using truth only um, because there are, there are reasons that it is a good time to buy. And when it's a good time to buy, it's a good time to sell. Um, there are more properties on the market. I think people are like, I think people think it's a better time to sell now than it will be six months from now. Um, and some of these numbers about why it's not a good time to buy are, um, you know, individual related. Is it a good time for me to buy? I just bought a house, right? So is, no, it's not a good time to buy. Um, it depends on how they ask the question and, and who they're asking to. All right. So, but when the market starts slowing down like this and people don't feel like it's a good time to buy, we do have to get them interested in our listings. And uh, it has been a while since you guys had to hold open houses and, and since you guys had to beg people to come see your listings and beg them to put in a, a reasonable offer and let them know that the seller is the seller is motivated. When's the last time you saw a seller motivated on anything? Um, right. So this is um, this is important. And this is, uh, you know, you guys, I know you guys have lot, done a lot of open houses, but it's been a while. So Angie is is our queen of open houses. She's done this. Um, this training for us about three years ago um, and uh, back when you guys were doing open houses. So, and it worked so well that the market just went into a complete seller's market. Angie did such a great job. So we're going to have her do it again. And uh, you guys, please pay attention. Um, I'm sure Angie will be glad to take questions and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Angie. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you asking me to do this again. It's funny how things just kind of happen like that. I've been thinking over the last couple of weeks how open houses are making a comeback and that I should offer this class again. Um, and I'm happy to offer a full class in person at the brokerage like we did before. Last time we had a title company sponsor, it brings some snacks. And I would like to believe that those things are back now too, in addition to open houses. Um, in-person classes. Um, so just a brief introduction. I think, you know, now is the time that we have to get buyers back in the market. Um, I'm sure a lot of them pulled out and a lot of mine did over the last year just because it was crazy and they just gave up. Um, and now it's the time to get them back in and to get them back interested in our listings and open houses are a great way to do that. Personally, I built my business from doing open houses, which I think a lot of you, I know a lot of other successful agents have also. Um, when I moved to Orlando and got my real estate license, um, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have family, friends, sphere. I didn't have, you know, kids in school for a long time to where I had a lot of connections. So doing open houses really worked for me to build up a clientele base. Um, I really love open houses because they help you do so many different aspects of marketing in one way. Um, I use my open houses for doing things like door knocking for a reason to have a Facebook ad for a reason to call past open house attendees. I use them for so many things that are important in real estate for us to keep doing to build up our business. Um, they, you know, the market's been challenging the past two years, but now I think is the time for us to get back out there and do them and to do them successfully requires quite a few different steps. Um, this presentation usually can last over an hour. Um, I've shortened it a little bit for today and then anybody who's super interested can reach out to me. Um, we do have a mentoring program at FRI that can help you totally set up every step with a checklist and everything that you need, marketing materials and everything um, with the mentor assisting you. Or, um, you know, if maybe there's something you could take away from today, I hope, if you're experienced or not. Um, open houses are great for brand new agents because they really do teach you so much stuff, but then even experienced agents doing them um, are able to get clients and, you know, do even, do even better with their business. Um, so it's giving you some, an open house will give you something to promote, right? So a lot of times we may have these past clients or new clients, new leads, and, you know, call them and what do we say? Oh, you know, the market's doing better now, there's more houses, but you know, having something else to say, having something else to talk about is really great. Or we are afraid to do, you know, Facebook, Instagram videos. So an open house might be something that's easier for you to talk about and gives you something to say. Um, there's other agents that are, you know, getting clients by just going to, you know, their kid's baseball game or PTA meetings or at church fa or Facebook at, you know, Facebook things. But where the buyers are, are going into open houses, right? Like you may meet somebody at, at, at a baseball game. They may say they want to buy and that's great. But actual buyers, people who are really looking to buy a home are going into open houses. They're seeing that sign and they're going. They're looking on Zillow in the morning and they're saying, let's go to these open houses. So big part of our job is to figure out where the buyers, sellers, clients are and get there and put ourselves there. Um, so that's why I really love open houses for lead generating. 
Now, the overall goal in an open house, if you're thinking you're there like to sell that actual house, you're probably going to be super disappointed by open houses. So I'm sure there's a lot of you that do an open house. They don't sell that house. The buyer, the right buyer for that house doesn't walk in the door and say, yes, write my offer right now. This is what I want to buy. I want to buy the house. That happens very seldomly, even though I've done, I don't know how many open houses, hundreds of open houses. It happens very seldomly. The real goal of an open house can't just be that. It has to be for you to do lead generation, for you to set appointments with buyers and sellers and to get more clients. Now, selling that house, of course, <laughs> needs to be important. You want to, that house needs to be sold, um, but the odds are just slim. So if that's your only focus, when you go into an open house, you're going to be disappointed. And then you're probably not going to do open houses again, because you're going to think they don't work. Um, but open houses do work. Lots of agents like myself have built their business from it. So it's to get buyer and seller leads is the real purpose of them and to meet the neighbors, right? Which are possible future buyer and seller leads. It's a real low cost way of marketing yourself doing an open house. There's plenty of other things you could do. You could pay for Zillow leads. You could pay for all kinds of other ads. Um, you could pay referral fees you know, to other companies for ads. But doing an open house is a really low cost way to market yourself. Um, it's just mostly sweat equity of you actually doing the work. Um, signs, flyers, things like that. You could print stuff out at the office you know, if you need to. Um, the marketing director for FRI, um, they have they have marketing materials already. So there's already a lot of stuff that's already set up for you and super easy to do. You just got to put in the time and your own energy. Um, so one of the first things I like to start off with is what house to do an open house at, right? Like if you have a listing, that's great. Your clients want an open house. Awesome. That's easy. You have the house, you have the listing, you go and you do the open house for it. If you don't have any listings of your own, or if your clients don't want an open house, or if the house is way far out in the woods and maybe not an ideal place for an open house, there's other options. So agents at our office, like myself and most of the other ones will allow you to do an open house for their listing if it's something that you know the seller allows also. I also plenty of times do open houses for agents at other brokerages. So finding the right house is pretty much the first step. If you're not doing your own listing for your clients, then you're gonna wanna find, first of all, location. Um, close to where you want to be, right? Like I don't want to travel an hour for an open house and then get a bunch of buyer leads that want houses an hour away from me. So close to where you want to work, either your farm area, your neighborhood, whatever it might be. Closer to the main roads is really important when picking a house. Um, then you'll need less signages. If it's less signage if you you know only have three or four turns. If you're way back in the middle of a subdivision, um, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Preferably if it's not gated, right? I mean, there's plenty of gates that will let you put up signs and let clients in. But for the most part, if it's not gated, um, you're going to want, if you're choosing an open house to choose one that's in, you know, close to a, a median price point of the neighborhood, I would suggest right now houses between 350 and 450 are great to host open houses at. Um, you're going to get the most buyers in that price point. If you go under that, it's going to sell really quickly. And if you start planning your open house on Monday, by Saturday, it's probably going to be sold. But in that 350 to 450 is a good price point to where it most likely will still be on the market and you'll be able to get the most buyers possible coming in. If you start looking at the higher end houses, million, two million dollar houses, those might be fun to sit in for the day for an open house, um, but they're not going to get you as many buyer leads, especially unrepresented buyers. A lot of million, two million dollar buyers, they have agents, they know a dozen agents, um, and that's not going to be as good to get you the most leads as possible. Um, you could do single family homes, townhomes. There are some condos and things like that too. So searching the brokerage, when I wrote this down, the FRI office code was 50344. So a good way to search it, what I was going to say in, and show kind of on the MLS is how I search for houses. I actually set up a search with um, all the FRI listings on it. And then I go to the map and circle the area that I want to be in. And then um, I make the price point, like I'm saying, 350 to 450. Sometimes I change it to single family homes. Um, sometimes I'll get super specific and say not gated. Um, if you're going to make it specific like that, you're going to want a big area. Um, and this worked great for me when I was in Orlando because there's mostly Orlando listings. And then now in Tampa, there's not as many FRI agent listings. Um, so that's why I've changed it and removed the FRI and just do any agents in this area that I want to be in. Um, you could check, you could search by days on market too. You can maybe do right now. I would do maybe five plus days on market. Um, if it's another brokerage, they might not want you to do an open house the first weekend, but after that they might. Um, so, you know, getting listing, getting other agents to do open houses for you is great. And, you know, doing them for other agents is awesome too. Has anybody here done own open house for another agent before? 
Yeah, kept with you. And have any of you had your listings and let other people do open houses for you? Yep, Tammy, for sure. Yep, okay, so Tammy's on board. Um, so awesome, yep, so that's that's what we do. We, we partner with other listings and, and get in the door so that you're working in the right area for the right type of house. It's gonna get you the most leads coming in the door and the most possibilities. Um, the best days and times for me for open houses have been Saturdays from one to 4 p.m. Sunday from one to four works good too. Um, a little bit later after church hours works okay. Even Wednesdays from four to seven when it's still light out at that time, like now. Um, Wednesdays four to seven work good, especially once school starts. Most kids get out of school early on Wednesdays. Um, then during the school year, you know, before the time changes, um, Wednesday, Wednesday afternoons have worked really good. Um, so prepping before, first step is find the perfect home, get that right listing that, that's working out good for you. Make sure it's put on the MLS. If you're not the listing agent, then ask the listing agent put on the MLS. Make sure it populates onto Zillow. So if it's not your listing, then I would say the day after you ask someone to put it on the MLS for you, go check and see that it's there, check and see that it's on Zillow. Um, reaching out to partners to help you, lenders, title officers, um, maybe another agent, it's a newer agent or another agent to partner with. It's really way safer to do these open houses with somebody else with you. Even if you're a grown man, there's been grown men, real estate agents um, that have had issues at open houses, um, safety issues. So safety for sure is a big concern. Getting somebody else to be there with you helps on a lot of different levels, but first and foremost, to make sure that you're safe. Um, they can partner with you of bringing the snacks, helping you put out the signs. They can give you information and knowledge. Like when I first started my real estate career, having a lender at the open house with me, like even when the open house wasn't busy, I learned so much by just asking them questions, you know, during those, during the downtime at open houses. Um, so I learned a lot about, you know, how the financing end works or the title officer, how the title end works. So it's a great time for you to get your own private class going on during your open house. Um, Preview the home a couple of days before. So Monday, you go on the MLS, you put in all your search criteria. Maybe you save it, save that search so that every Monday you can check it out. Find the house that's a good a good fit for you. Reach out to the agent and um, get you know get permission to do it. So I usually send. Lately, I've just been sending texts. I do call, but not always answer getting phone answers. Send a text. Say, hey, this is Angie with with FRI. I noticed your beautiful listing at this address. I'm available to host an open house. Is this Saturday or Sunday better for you? Something short and sweet, giving them an A, B close with two options. Um, and very often they say yes. Occasionally they'll say, no, I don't let other agents host open houses for me, or my broker doesn't let us let us do that. I usually stay away from asking like Caldwell Banker, Remax, Keller Williams, because they usually have a ton of agents that do this stuff for them. Um, but there's tons of smaller brokerages out there that will allow it. So then a couple of days before, once you get it all set up, you're ready to go, go preview the home. So it's really important that you know this house that you're about to sell and that you know some insider information to give out during your open house. So preview the house, see what's going on with it, you know, walk it, get some ideas of it, get the seller property disclosure from the MLS or the agent, know some things about this house. One of the real important things at an open house is to not just be somebody that's there opening the door, but have some other information that, that these buyers can take with them. Um, that they couldn't get just from Zillow or just from Googling the address. So knowing a little bit more of what's going on with the house, the seller property disclosure, the age and condition of the roof, the HOA information, all that type of stuff is super important to know about this house that you're going to be hosting an open house at. Um, during that time, I usually do a video walkthrough and like a, a prep for the open house and for a video for social media. So it's a good time to take a quick video walkthrough or just a quick video out front of the house. Hold your camera out in front of you. Hi, this is Angie. I'm going to be doing an open house this Saturday from one to four. Stop by and see me. I'm going to be in this neighborhood and uh, the house will be open for your viewing. It's a beautiful four bedroom, three bath. Um, come by and check it out. See me on Sunday. Um, so a quick video outside um, is important to do when you're previewing the home the week before your open house. The next thing I like to do a couple of days before the open house is do some door knocking. So that's why I love open houses because it just allows you to combine all different types of aspects of real estate marketing and promotion into one thing. Um, door knock and make some nice flyers, color flyers, black and white flyers. It doesn't matter with the picture of the home, the time and date on them. Invite them to come, start up conversations, how long you lived in the neighborhood, anything you could tell me that I can let other buyers know when they're coming in about living in this neighborhood. Um, the ones that complain, hey, you know, at least they're talking to you. 
Um, but yeah, there will be neighbors that complain and tell you things you might not want to know. But for the most part, they'll say, oh, it's a beautiful neighborhood. We love living here. You know, we're here because the schools are so great. Or they'll tell you something about the neighborhood that can give you something to say at your open house talking to the other people. And you could say, hey, a lot of the neighbors here are super friendly. I walked around, you know, met a lot of them. They were telling me how great the schools are. Um, so door knocking is great to, to try to get appointments out of that and to also get some more insider information about it. Let's see, and then moving on after you do your little video, promoting it, sharing on social media, paying for a boosted ad if you want, if you want to spend money, marketing money on that. Um, then during getting, then getting prepped for the actual open house. You're going to want to have some flyers or some information available for people coming into your open house. Sometimes you can do it as simple as printing out a customer synopsis from the MLS. Other times you might want an actual flyer that's more of an ad. There's a lot of different companies. Um, like list reports that'll give you a nice report that you can use from open houses, your title company or your lender. Um, my lender usually makes me uh, a flyer that has the estimated mortgage amounts on it. They'll put, you know, an FHA, a VA, a conventional or conventional with 5% down, conventional with 20% down and the different prices for the estimated mortgage on that house with the list price that it's at now. So getting all of your information ready that you're going to pass out. You don't have to go big with these open houses. You don't have to have a full spread of food. You don't have to have a ton of giveaways. You know, you could easily do it simple with just a flyer, just yourself and a flyer. Um, you know, you can also put out bottled water, candy, baked cookies, um, things like that. Over the last couple of years, I haven't had to do much. Um, but before that, we were doing, you know, full, full food, you know, if a title company or lender offers um, or, you know, some small thing in between. Putting out signs is super important. I would say 60 to 75% of the people walking through my open houses are coming just from my signs. They don't know anything about this house. They did not see it online. They just saw my signs. Um, and that's a really high percentage where the majority of people coming into my open houses are from signs. And how do I know? Because I asked them. Um, asked them and I write it down after I asked them. I like to write notes. So since that's so important, putting out signs is extremely important. If you're going to do an open house without signs, I feel like you're just wasting your time. It'd be way better to skip one of the other steps than skipping putting out signs. Um, you'll most likely be sitting there alone with instead of, you know, 10 people coming through, you'll have three or two. Um, so signs, locations, you could map it out in advance when you go there to preview the home, see where the best place for the signs are going to be, put them out. Um, 20 signs is great. Having at least 20 signs in stock is awesome. I know the office has a couple signs. Um, I have a whole, I have two sets of 20. So I have some to borrow. If anybody wants to borrow, you can let me know. They're branded with my phone number on them. So I don't mind sharing them because then you're out marketing for me. Um, and then uh, if you, if you want to invest in your own, you can invest in some cheap ones that just say open house with an arrow, or you can actually get your own branded ones. You know, I used the cheap ones for years and then got the budget together to to make my own. Um, the signs need to get out, you know, is I used to do like one on a corner, right? But I don't know if you guys have seen lately, now we're all putting like three or four in a line, you know, three or four in a line pointing in one direction and then three or four in a line on both sides of the street um, and getting it, you know, really clear on where the open house is. Um, so getting those signs out before, then um, during the open house, you know, I have a whole checklist of things. If anybody wants to kind of know a little bit more details, I'd be happy to, to help them out with that. But really the most important thing at the open house is to build rapport with people, keep eye contact going, talk to one person at a time. Um, that's why it's great to have either another agent or a lender or somebody else there with you for when people walk in at the same time. Building that rapport, not just asking them, you know, do you want to buy this house, but really developing, you know, asking them what they're looking for, more detailed questions about, you know, what they're looking for this house for. Um, and since so many people do come in from the signs, I usually start with things along the lines of, you know, how'd you, how'd you hear about my open house? Oh, we saw the signs. Okay, great. So that means you, so then I'm like, so then you didn't see, you didn't see the house online. You just saw the signs. And they're like, yes, we didn't. I was like, okay, well, this is a four bedroom, three bath. It's priced at six fifty. Is that about what you're looking for? And then sometimes they're like, oh, no, not at all. You know, I'm looking for 350. And it's like, okay, well, let me see what else we have for you. And I go on the MLS and look for other listings for them to talk to them about. 
Um, or they say, yeah, absolutely. That's great. And I'm like, okay, let's go on a tour. Let's go check out the house. I let them go off and see the house pretty much on their own. If it's an occupied house with furnishings and personal property in it, I stay close. Um, if not, then I just kind of it's vacant. I just kind of let them go. Um, we don't need to say this is the living room. This is the bedroom. They know what the rooms are. Um, just pointing out any special features, the roof age, uh, other things that they can't see. The plumbing it was just replumbed, whatever it might be. Um, after that, then the real important part is to get the appointment. That's why you're there. You're not there to just be a tour guide. You're not there to just open a door. You're not there to serve cookies. Uh, we're there to get appointments and to, to book these appointments. So going for the close and going for the appointment is super important. If I find out through my conversations with people that they're just a buyer, they're not a seller, then I work on scheduling a buyer consultation. And I let them know that I have other houses like this. I have other listings. And I'd love to sit down and talk to you about what your needs are so that it can help you find the right home. I'm available to meet you at my office or we can meet at a local coffee shop if that's easier for you. And are, you know, are you available this Tuesday when, or Wednesday or our evenings or weekends better for you? Um, and then scheduling the appointment for that. If somebody's a seller, of course, I'm all over them like crazy. Uh, if they have a house to sell before they buy, then I'm working on getting in the door of seeing their house and setting up that appointment to see their house. Um, asking them questions like, do you know how much your home is worth? Do you know how much you would want for your home? You know, if you, if you sold your house at that price, would you be able to buy what you want? You know, those type of questions to get to get the appointment um, and then going from there with, you know, let's sit down, show me your home. Let me tell you a real number. Everything you're going to find online, you know, is going to be just in general. I could tell you a real specific number of what you can get for your home um, in this current market with the conditions that are going on now after just a quick walkthrough. So tell me what day do you have 30 minutes for me to walk through your house and tell you your home's value. Are you free this Tuesday or this Wednesday um, and getting the appointment. That's the number one goal of sitting all day in an open house and putting out signs in the heat and door knocking and doing the videos and everything that we're doing. The goal is to get these appointments and to get in front of people so that we can close the deal and work towards getting a commission check. I always take very detailed notes on my conversations. Um, as soon as they walk away, I take a minute to write it down. I usually just write it down in my iPhone notes because I always have my phone on me um, and I don't really use paper too much. I have a note that says the address of the house, the open house day and time, and then I write notes. Um, I do oh, a sign-in sheet. I almost forgot sign-in sheet. That is like so important. I know a lot of people hate sign-in sheets. Raise your hand if you hate telling people to sign in at open houses. I know half of you, I can't see you, but I know your hands are up. Everybody's like, oh, it's so annoying asking people to sign in. Ryan would hate it. That's why he doesn't do that job. Um, so it's, it is, it is super annoying. And trust me in the beginning, when I first started, I was super frustrated and I was like nervous and, you know, stood back while somebody's like, no, I don't want to sign in. And I was just taking it. And then I realized that this is not their house. This is not a public place. The house that you have open is not the grocery store. It's not somewhere where they have every right to walk in and walk around and do whatever they want there. They have no rights to be there, except for the fact that we're there letting them in for the purpose of an open house for selling that house. So we have every right to ask them for their personal information if they wanna come into this house. There have been times when people did not wanna tell me their personal information and I asked them to leave. And it's not easy, it's not fun, but why the hell not? What did I have to lose from that? Maybe I felt bad for a few minutes, but really if they don't wanna do that, then they're obviously not gonna work with me. They're obviously not gonna buy this house because if they really cared about seeing it, they would do that. Um, so asking them for their information, things like, let me see, I have some of my notes here of ways to say it. Um, things like, um, you know, I need to sign in. Everybody needs to sign in. The owner asks, want to make sure I'm doing my job here. You know, so they asked me to get everyone to sign in. I, um, for a while, was using my iPad for sign-ins during like COVID and stuff just to kind of keep it... Um, I was just doing it myself on my iPad. So I would ask them the information and sign in. I think I've been doing that still now too. So instead of having a piece of paper with a pen out, like I used to always do, I actually write it myself on my phone or on my iPad. So I asked them their name. I was like, hey, can I get you to sign in? And then I'll give you a tour of the home. Get their first name, last name. Um, and I ask, what's a good email for you? What's a good phone number? Great, thank you. Um, and if they say something like, I don't want to give you my email and say, okay, then just give me your cell number and that'll be fine. If they say, I don't want to give you either one, then I'm saying, sorry, but the owners asked me to collect information from everybody who's inside their home. If you don't want to provide it, then I understand. 
you can have your realtor call and schedule a, a showing and your realtor can give their information. Um, so that's what I get. First name, last name, email, and phone number. And then on that same list that I do my sign-ins on is where I write all my personal notes. And then I send it to my assistant to put in the CRM. Um, so the second most important thing, the first point thing is getting appointments, making sure you have everybody's contact information. Otherwise, there's no reason for them to be there. The second most important thing is the follow-up. You've, if you've listened to any type of real estate training, it's all in the follow-up. And it 100% is with open houses too. Um, there are times when people agree to meet with me and give me an appointment. And then if I don't follow up to confirm that appointment, then it's never going to happen. Then there's people who aren't ready to set an appointment with me at the open houses. And I need to follow up to get that appointment. Um, so it's all in the follow-up, getting a good follow-up plan that works for you. Uh, I like to text people at the open house with the MLS app. I use the, my MLS app where it's branded for me and I can share the app and they, um, download it that way. You can use, you know, your own, if you have a CRM that has an app, you could share that. I like to do that while I'm there at the open house, because then I can hear their phone beep or see them look at it and know that they gave me the right cell number too. Um, and so then I send them a text while I'm there in front of them. And then uh, text confirmation, texting is pretty easy nowadays and it's a pretty, pretty common way to follow up, um, getting their email added to your CRM and setting up an MLS search for them, whatever it might be for your next follow-up. Um, but that's a super important part too of following up. And if you didn't get an appointment that day at the open house, then the goal is to get an appointment at your next follow-up. Um, at the open house, I like to take a video. I send video thank yous too. So if the house has a pool, I might film myself in front of the pool saying, hey, thanks for coming to tour this house today. Hope you enjoyed it. It was located at this address. Um, if you have any other questions, reach out to me. Um, and I send personalized videos that are just super short, like 30 seconds. And if I have a lender or title officer with me, I have them in the video with me too. They don't often like to talk on video because like a lot of you, they're afraid of that. Um, if you're doing an open house for another agent, please make sure you're sending them an update afterwards. Let them know how many people came through. Let them know any feedback that you heard. Let them know anything you feel about the house. If there was dead roaches, if there was anything, just let them know any feedback. It's super important that they're doing you a favor of letting you host an open house. You're doing them a favor by updating them after so they could tell their seller what's going on. If there's any realtors that attend the open house, I send that information to the listing agent too so they could follow up with those. Um, Back to the safety point, make sure that you have somebody else with you there. People know where you are. Um, give clients space. You know, you don't need to go inside a bedroom with an, a client. You could stay out in the hallway. Um, make sure people know where you are. Keep your phone on you. Um, do your market research. Be an expert on that area. Know some information so that you can give out at, at them. Um, and then make sure you're doing the follow-up to get, to get the clients in. Um, that was kind of just a quick run through. I know some people were posting stuff in the chat. I wanted to make sure I kind of got all through that. Um, it's, it's Malvis asked how far in advance do we put on open house? <laughs> the last couple of years have not been a good indicator because we can plan open houses and they get canceled. Ideally, it'd be nice to start planning them a, a week before is really all you need if you have things in place. Monday, I do my search on the MLS to find which house I want to do an open house at if I don't already have my own listing planned. Um, so Monday, I do the search. Um, Tuesday or Wednesday, I go and preview the house. And then Wednesday or Thursday, I do door knocking and then do the open house usually on Saturday um, and do an ad, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, do a Facebook ad. So you only need five days or so to get everything done from, from my point of view of everything that I'm planning. Um, if you, it's, it's hard to take much more time, even in this market right now. It's slowed down a bit, yes, but you know, if it's a good house and good location, you know, it's hard to have it on the market much longer than that. Any other questions? I know I talk fast. Uh, Angie, I have a question. When uh, I'm open to uh, uh, do open houses for another uh, agent and another broker and vice versa, last couple of years I had a couple agents contact me in that circumstance. Uh, is it pretty much, have any of them asked for any favors or anything other than the obvious that we like to get is uh, buyer leads on these? Um, have any of them asked for anything over and above that? So are you referring are, to the agents asking the other agent, the buyer yes, agent? Are you, self, are, you, are you going with just the expectations? Look, if I can get a couple of buyer leads out of this, I'm fine and vice versa. 
from other yeah agents. so you know there's there's agents at other brokerage i know when i was at keller williams in the beginning um at first this one agent would let me do open houses for all the time and then i guess i don't know if she saw my business was building from it and now she decided that she wanted all the listing leads that came from that open house and i was like no, <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not doing all I'm not doing this work and giving out my listing leads, but as a listing agent, you can set whatever rules you want. So if that's what you want, as long as you're clear about that from the beginning, Hey, I, you know, I don't know of any rules that are going to stop any of us from that. Um, so there was, there is agents that ask for stuff from the buyer agent that wants to do the open house. As far as the buyer agent asking the listing agent for anything, you know, I haven't heard of anything or know of anything. Um, I think if you go into this with the intention of promoting their home, the best you can, getting some extra promotions out there with some ads and signs pointing towards it. I mean, I think that's a great benefit to any listing agent and to any seller that has a house on the market. Um, so I see the benefits to, to having an open house, even though, you know, like I said, usually that exact buyer is not going to come through the door and see it at that open house, but it's not always, sometimes it is. And any promotion of that house is going to be great. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yes. Thank you. Okay, for sure. Does anybody have any open house challenges? Like you've done open houses, then you gave up for this reason. I know there's a lot of you like that out there. Hi, Angie, this is Shikha. Uh, how are you? This was wonderful class. You gave so many good points. And uh, I have one question about you mentioned, uh, I'm just joined, I'm new to FRI. Uh, for, uh, you mentioned for MLS app, you can uh, give it to uh, the client, but uh, can you just tell me about more of that uh, for the app? Sure. It's called My MLS. Okay. And, um, I'm pretty sure it has the same name on Google and on, on Apple. Um, and you just download the app and then it'll ask you to log in. It'll say what, um, what board you're on. It'll say, you know, select Stellar MLS or well, I think you select Florida first then Stellar MLS. Um, and then it will have your login credentials, just like when you're logging into the MLS. You can set it up with your picture and your contact information. And then you can go to share my app is one of the menu settings there. And you can text a link to a client and then they can download the MLS app themselves and then they'll log in as a consumer. And they'll be able to search homes that are on the MLS and everything will be branded with your information. Um, so the listing agent's not there. It's just your contact information. And it also alerts you. So if somebody sets up the account and they save a house, they favorite it, it'll send you an alert to say so-and-so favorited this house. And then you could reach out to them to follow up and get them more information on that house. Oh, wonderful. I think Home Snap is also does the same thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's quite yeah. a few options. Um, yeah, lot of, okay, okay. Lot of, I, uh, I don't, yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anyone else, any open house challenges? Did an open house and this happened or I stopped doing open houses because of this? Hi Angie, Barbara. this is Barbara. Hey Barbara, how are you? Good. Hey, um, I have a listing coming up in a gated community and there's mm -hmm. five active listings in that community right now. I've never really done an open house in a gated community. Do you have any mm -hmm. advice? Yeah, so you have to talk to the gate and you have to talk to the HOA to see how they work it. I know some of them, like in in Spring Isle and Avalon Park over there, I used to do a lot of work there and they do not allow any signs. And they, I put out a sign the first open house I did. I thought I could break the rules because sometimes I try to push the limits and they banned me from doing open houses there. Um, so they were very serious. They put me in timeout for like a year until management changed and then I got back in the door. Um, so there's some places like that past the gate, you can't put any signs at all. So you can have it on the MLS, you can have it on Zillow, but you can't have any signs. Then you could tell the gate person there, like at that person, for example, I gave them one of my flyers when I went in and told them if anyone comes into the open house, here's my number, you can call me. The owner can tell the gate, you know, the open house is here, here's how you get there. Um, and I was allowed to put signs outside, you know, on the regular streets, you could put open house signs on the main roads, just not inside past the gate. So it really depends on the area there. So I would ask them, what are the rules on open houses and signage? Um, like in Spring Isle, for example, you're not allowed to put for sale signs out either. So there's like zero signs and there's a zero tolerance. Like they're not playing over there. And then other areas would be like, yeah, you could put, I know some areas, they told me you could put one sign at each corner. Um, so another gated area said I could put one sign at each corner. So they're all different. So ask them, and I would still recommend to do it. Um, 
because and you can get the neighbors too so if you are allowed to put some signs even if it's a gated area a lot of the neighbors can come out um and if it's a gated community even if it's not signs other neighbors will come out and you're already in the door it's a good reason to to talk to people in that neighborhood yeah i was thinking about because there's five other active listings in that community talking to those other agents and seeing if they want to sure. do open houses at the same time Absolutely. Yep. I've done that before too. And that works out really good. So yeah, maybe just send a group email out to all of them and say, Hey, I'm thinking about doing an open house this day and time. If you'd like to host also, it'll give us some more, some uh, more traffic coming through for all, for all marketing it. Yeah. The more traffic, the better. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks. Hey, Angie, I just want to interject. Um, the uh, FRI does have signs. We just replenished our um, open house signs. Um, we do take a deposit on them. You guys can borrow them. We take a deposit in case you don't return them, which is why we had to go get some new ones. Um, but uh, we do take a deposit on the signs. You want to get 10 or 15 or 20 of them or something like that. That's what we've got. We actually have 20. So if you guys, as long as you're not doing it on the same weekend, uh, just call ahead and reserve them when you need them. And um, we will collect a deposit and then return the deposit when the signs are returned. So be careful with them also, just like you would have to your own signs, because sometimes they will disappear if you place them, um, if you place them carelessly where you shouldn't be placing them. So be careful with those, be judicious with where you place your signs. Um, Angie, I think that some of the folks here, they, they listen to you. And I, I know I raised my hand for that part about asking, that's not really, uh, my personality at all. Of course I would, because you guys, uh, you hear me all the time tell you don't waste your time and you are wasting your time. If you got somebody who won't even commit to giving you their real information, they're not going to buy a house with you. Um, and so I think Angie's response to that is perfect. It's not, you know, get the heck out of here. Then it's have your agent call. Cause we're not letting, we're not, you know, you stick with it. You are, you are consistent with the message that the seller just doesn't want any random in his house that he doesn't know who they are, or have any kind of, of responsibility or any kind of accountability. Like when you guys show houses, that's why you you make people pull your showing instructions and you make them, um, and you so you have their information, you know who's going into your seller's house, even if you're not there to show it. And I think that's very important. And I think Angie's response to that is perfect with the uh, contact your agent, have your agent um, do that. So they have, at least they have the agent's information. You have the licensee's information, it's very important. Um, but I think a lot of people listen to Angie and they think, well, that's not my personality. Angie has a, has a, uh, she is not a timid salesperson. Um, I've seen her kids. They're not skinny. She feeds her kids because, um, because that's what, that's what you do. If you want to eat, you, you do have to sell guys. This is a, this is a sales for your license as salesperson. You have to sell, you have to do the things that make you a little bit uncomfortable, step outside your comfort zone. So Yes, I know you hear her saying these things. You think, oh, well, I couldn't do that or I wouldn't want to. You have to. And it's work. Angie, is it work? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. It's it's a hundred percent how I grew my business. My first transactions ever was a client that I met at an open house. A husband and wife came in. They didn't have a realtor or they said they didn't have a realtor. I They said they had to sell their house before they could buy. They really wanted to buy the house at the open house. They I set an appointment with them. I was nervous as can be because it was my first listing appointment. And I uh, went and met with them. They also spoke Spanish primarily. So it was a little bit of a language barrier, but I still sat down and talked with them. They signed the listing agreement. We put in an offer on that open house. They didn't get it because somebody else did. Um, but that was my first. And I did a, a buy and sell the same day closing. So my first transaction ever was from an open house. And then, you know, my first couple of years, it was like 80% of my transactions were from open houses. And even now, you know, I still get clients that way too. And it's, it works if you do the things, if you do the, to the, set the appointments and you have, and you get brave. It's not easy at first. I wasn't like, I went into this being an excellent salesperson. I don't have any real sales experience before this. It was hard at first and I got shot down and I wasted my time and then wasted my energy. And I learned, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to spend my whole day at this house and not with my kids. I want to make money. So what I have to do is be more bold. I have to say, do you want to meet with me next week? What else do I have to lose? You know, have you ever gotten anything from the door knocking? Yeah, absolutely. I've gotten listing appointments where I've gone out and, and met with them and listed and, and have listed and sold their houses. A lot of times it's longer term leads, you know, because a door knock is a very cold out of nowhere type thing. So finding somebody who's ready to sell right then is, is unlikely. Um, but I have a listing 
I door knocked on his house four years ago. And uh, I've been following up with him ever since. And now he just texted me yesterday that in six weeks, the house will be ready for the market. It's in Oviedo. And I'm like, all right, I'll drive back to Oviedo from Tampa um, to, to take this listing because I've worked for it for four years now, you know. Um, and it was because I had a listing nearby. I was doing an open house and I went and knocked on his door. So yeah, sometimes they're long-term leads, but if you keep nurturing them, they'll come out. Yeah, Angie said that's a cold lead, but it's a it's a, the, the door knocking is cold, but not if you have an open house coming down the street. It's a little bit warmer it's, where you have something exactly. to talk about. You're mm -hmm. not just knocking on their door and saying, hey, I'm a realtor. Like, great. You know, mm -hmm. um, I was worried I wouldn't see 11 of them today. Right. So, um, no, that's really good. And, and I love what you're doing there. And I love that story of your first deal. Um, and I think that's a very I, I love stories like that. You had no commonality at all with these folks who you had a language barrier with them mm -hmm. and they still used you to buy their mm -hmm. house because you hustled. No other reason. No um, other reason. Because I asked. Really, it was just because I asked because I asked, can I come see your house this week? Can it come to your house this day? Will you sign this listing agreement? All it was was because I asked. We didn't have any connection or any any reason. No, they didn't already know me, like me, or trust me. They, you know, it just worked because I asked. Well, it well, it, it worked. You and you asked because you were hustling. You were out there, mm -hmm. and they were in, like you mentioned before, they were in a real estate friendly environment. That's you know, they were interested in real estate, which is why you met mm -hmm. them to start with, because you were doing a real estate related activity. You know, yes. you talked about. Uh, you know, the, the soccer moms or the, you know, whatever the soccer moms and dads, the soccer families, and you go to these games and you, and you have this commonality with these folks and you talk to them and, and you get deals like that, right? You get deals from people you meet in the PTA and the, all these things, cause you have commonality with these folks, your kids play together or whatever, and you have commonality and that's great. But to be successful in this business, you have to uh, mix, you know, get three deals here and two deals there and five deals here and three deals there to make yourself a successful year. Right. And so you have all these different things you put together or you just blitz the market with lots of money and lots of marketing and you get them all the same way. But eventually you're also going to put referrals on top of that and everything else. So uh, repeat business and referrals. So you have to piece these things together. But this is a, a completely real estate related. You're going to like like you said, Angie, I can't I can't tell me better. And I really appreciate uh, the way you phrase that. Uh, these people are in the real estate environment. They're serious buyers yeah. because they're out there doing stuff They, You know, some of them, they are longer term and they were just kicking tires at the time, but they have some kind of interest in it. Or they wouldn't have been doing it. And like you said, the open houses, the neighbors come, the looky loo neighbors come and just to be nosy about that or get ideas for their house because yeah. they live five houses down and one across the street and they have the exact same model and they want to see uh, how that looks in their house, you know? So um, that is really, uh, really great stuff. Do you guys have any more questions for Angie? Yes. Um, Angie, you, you're in Tampa? Yes, I am now, yeah. Okay, you're enough. picking up a listing in Oviedo? Mm -hmm. No, oh, you can't I'll, have. <laughs> I'll throw my hat in the ring if you need an agent to help you out. I'm not too far from Oviedo. <laughs> Okay. No, I appreciate that. I do have, um, you know, quite a few Orlando agents and some that I do referrals with, um, you know, ideally I'd like to have an agent partner with me, which I've done before, um, at 10% to do kind of the on-site stuff of be there for the appraisal, be there to pick up the sign in the lockbox, um, do some of the work. So if anybody's up for that, then I do have, um, some listings that I've been working for years and I'm not going to hundred percent let go of, um, but then any new leads to referral. So for sure, I put my information in the chat. You guys can text me or call me if you want um, some of my leads. Cause I, I, I mean, I do this long-term marketing and it's saved me a lot of money. I've spent very little money on marketing. I've never bought a Zillow lead or realtor.com lead. I've never bought those type of leads. Um, you know, I spent a little bit of money on Facebook ads, but not very much. I really do mostly the sweat equity stuff. So when it finally pays off, it's, it's hard for me to refer it out. <laughs> very good. Uh, guys, um, and learn about your. I want to. One thing I want to say about that when you when you brought that up, Angie, was um, learn about your videos. How to how to do some video marketing as far as labeling your videos and putting them on your YouTube channel and stuff like that. So when it says, mm -hmm. um, let's say Angie does an open house in Temple Terrace uh, near her area, there, um, open house Temple Terrace this weekend, right? Because people are going to Google that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. and that's kind of stuff that pops up when you do that. So it increases your chances, but learn about how to how to title your videos um, 
and do things like that so they pop up for people who are searching because people will search they'll just google whatever they want to know and uh, are there any open houses in tampa this weekend and you yep. just hit all of them right hit all of their their buzzwords so um i, I love that and you said you're boosting those angie on facebook yeah I okay. used to be like years ago, we used to be able to boost ads to like the small little neighborhood. Right. And it was super nice. Um, went before, before kind of, I guess, HUD stepped in and said that the fair housing laws, um, now make us go 30 mile radius for doing any marketing. But before Facebook four or five years ago, we could target just the neighborhood. So I could do an open house and send the ad out to just that neighborhood. Then when I would go door knock, they would tell me, I see you everywhere. And at first I was like caught off guard and I was like, oh yeah, it's because I boosted that ad. And like I said, you know, I paid for like a thousand people to see it. And it was in such a small area that pretty much everybody on Facebook in that neighborhood saw my open house ads. Um, and that was really nice. But now, you know, now it needs to be more specific. But if you do things like put the subdivision name in there, then people searching for that or people that are, you know, uh, already on search groups like that then they could do it and putting it on the community groups that you're doing in open house, things like that will get you some promotion, some more localized neighborhood um, eyes on it. All right. Fantastic. Yes. I, I, I know. And that used to be really good too, because even if you're just, I don't know if you guys know this, but back then, even if you're just driving through that area mm -hmm. and you popped on your Facebook, you stopped at Starbucks and you got on your Facebook, you would see Angie's ad yeah. would come up. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so any other uh, questions or comments for, for Angie? Um, Angie, you had asked, or someone had asked a question. I think Mike asked if, if agents wanted anything else when you did open house for them. Um, Ida put that someone asked her for 25% of any listing leads that came out of it or buyer lead, listing leads, I believe she said. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that might be reasonable. If you agree to it, you agree to it. Like, I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me, whatever you agree to, like, and if, you know, a listing agent wants to ask for that, hey, you know, it is what it is. I don't ask for anything. If anybody wants to host an open house for me, you could do it to take all the leads. Um, you know, all I ask for is an update afterwards. Okay. So, uh, uh, Mike, were you asking if you could do a uh, an open house for Angie and Oviedo? Correct. I maybe not have made that clear. But, yeah, yeah open oh, houses. Yeah. I, I, I like open houses. Mm -hmm. I, no, I, Absolutely. I, that's definitely a possibility. The owners are living there. So I, we haven't really kind of gone through open house timeframes um, and, you know, times to get them out of the house, but it's definitely going to be helpful. So for sure, Mike, I'll definitely. All right. Thank you. For that for um, and guys, um, if you are not, I'm going to type her email in here right now. If you are not on our um, Facebook page, Get on there. Um, I know that a lot of open houses change. Uh, sorry, I'm having a hard time typing. A lot of uh, people want people to work open houses. A lot of people looking to work open houses. Um, I put uh, Jari's number, our marketing coordinator, in the chat, her email. Um, if you're not on there, ask her for a link. Or you can go on Facebook and look up FRI Agents Group. Don't do FRA agents page. That's been shut down for years. Go to FRA agents group. Um, and you're going to have to ask, ask to join and we will let you on. Only our agents are on there. No uh, vendors or anyone else. So. Um, have you so, been removed from old agents? Um, we don't discriminate against older people, Angie. I <laughs> love <Not> that. <laughs> Good one. Oh, um, uh, yes, I, I did see um, some older, I, I mean, I, I did see some former agents milling around on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes, I will. It's interesting that they do, but uh, yes, I will. Okay. Uh, I go through there once in a while and do that, but it's. Okay, great. And then just to wrap it up, if anyone needs accountability or mentorship for something like this, of setting up a whole plan um, for for, for follow-up, for, you know, what to say, for marketing materials, anything like that, you know, I'm available for mentoring and there's other agents in the office too um, that can help you out. So reach out to me and we'll get you hooked up with the right agent. That's the right fit for you to, to help you get this plan into action. Fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Doreen has an open house in Riverview. This If anyone wants to do one for her listing in, in Riverview this Saturday, please reach her. And her number is on there. Um, 
So okay. guys, look out for that. Please put that on our, our FRI. That's a great place to put it on our FRI agents group um, if you're interested. Um, those of you in Orlando, you go spend a day at the beach and, and do a uh, do an open house. Um, okay, any other questions or comments for Angie? Angie, you get great feedback. You did a great job. We really appreciate you. Um, Thank you. Um, you have uh, have uh, done a wonderful job, and I love what you do. I love the hustle. Guys, if you want to do uh, the kind of things that Angie does, you have to do the kind of work that Angie does. And so um, get out there and get busy and get active, and uh, that's the way you do it. Um, Malva says, thank you. Great info. Thank you, Rihanna. Um, I think that is me. Um, you're very welcome, Elvis. Um, so um, you guys have any other questions? <laughs> no, no problem. Um, you guys have any other questions or comments for Angie? And Angie, I want to thank you very much. Um, you guys, we will see you next week. Thank you all. I will talk to you soon. Angie, you were amazing. Thank um, you. I appreciate it. The opportunity best, to talk to you. best car presentation ever. <laughs> all right. Thank I you very much. All right. Bye. <laughs>